Nearly from the time I was born, I was never good enough. I never suffered enough. I never felt guilty enough. I never was ashamed enough. They always wanted more. There was nothing I could do. No matter how hard I tried, no matter how good I was, whatever I did, they always wanted more. She tried to tear my genitals off when I was 18 months old. Because I'd soiled my diaper. He started grooming me not long after that. Before he had me stretched enough so he could penetrate me vaginally, he made me perform oral on him. A small little three-year-old child mouth and throat with a full-size penis inside of it. And he'd start trusting. And he'd shove that thing in my throat. And of course I gagged. And I had tears in my eyes. And it made him excited. Is he getting me hitting the head with that rock and having that one tooth break? That's not the only reason there's something wrong with my teeth. I couldn't brush my molars. Every time I did, I'd puke. My gag reflex was so strong that I would not only dry vomit once all the contents, my stomach was gone and the bile was gone. I can taste it. But I'd vomit until blood came up. So I stopped brushing my molars and started chewing sugarless gum. Today I was on the fundraiser for Joseph Mackey's Atheist Helping the Homeless. I was in the first hour. If I get a broadcast of it, I'll share it with you. I thought I really made some progress. I explained what it's really like to be homeless. I described it. How hard we have to work. How dangerous it is. How terribly people treat us. The religious indoctrination. The self-hatred. The stress that causes mental health issues or exacerbates mental health issues. I told them my genitals were mutilated. I told them I have brain injuries and that my genitals are mutilated and that I have PTSD from severe child abuse. I didn't go into any detail. I talked about stigmatizing people with mental health issues and how the atheists compare religions to being crazy or schizophrenic or bipolar or brain injured and that they really need to stop that. Because they're stigmatizing me. They're not doing anything to hurt the churches or the mosques or whatever. They're hurting people like me. They're stigmatizing us. I even told a story about that genderqueer kid on YouTube who now identifies as male, went through high school as a female, was planning to transition, had to get into sex work to survive because, of course, her parents threw her out, became addicted, and then the Christians got a hold of her. And now he's trying to be a man. And you can see the pain in his eyes. So he's traded one addiction for another. He's traded mind-altering chemicals for this. Because he gets love and acceptance and approval. I told him all this stuff. And I went to Gender Queer Idiots on Facebook and I said, I think I've really helped. I think I've really helped. I, it was so nice not to feel powerless. Not to feel silenced. Not to feel gagged and muted. And have my story disappeared. In fact, one of the philosophy guys, I'll list his name in the um, links below because I can't remember. It ends with a seven, something with whispering in it. He said that some of the stories he heard in the first hour were moving and touching. After I was off the Skype from the first hour, I went back into the chat room and hung out and I was there for three hours and then Coughlin came on. I remembered I'd unsubscribed from Coughlin's channel because he'd said something rude and disrespectful, either about women or queers. I don't remember what. And I don't need smarmy white boys in my ass. But Coughlin was being kind enough to donate his time for this, um, fundraiser and I was in the chat 
chatting away with people and was involved in that. And then all of a sudden, out of the corner of my ear, Coughlin makes sound. I'm paraphrasing. Because it wasn't until he said it that I actually became alert. The gist of it was, he really likes homeless people because homeless women are available for sexual exploitation. And then he gleefully said, I can't see the chat room. I can't see the chat room in the blog TV. He couldn't see it from the Skype. He, want, he said, I want to hear it, see them complaining. I tapped and typed into the chat. I'm not complaining. I'm crying. I feel so betrayed. Uh, the moderator asked me if I was okay. I said no in private. And then the moderator said, oh, well, he's being nice. He's helping raise money. You know, divinity talks about survival sex. How it's different than actual sex work because actual sex work is of your own volition. About having to perform sexual functions for a roof over your head or something to eat or a ride or in some people's cases drugs and alcohol Coughlin will never know what he did to me I was completely triggered chest pains ears ringing he unraveled all the good I'd done in the previous hour and I told him it had meant so much to me because, you know, I talk about um, existential optimism. It's my only defense against suicidal depression. And this was an act of existential optimism for me. Like I said, to be able to have a voice. For, there's a woman next door living in a tent. A single mother with her daughter. In the rain. It's rain. It's the monsoon season. And to have a voice for myself, to, not not only, absolutely it's important, I feel like I helped atheists helping the homeless. I think I did, because I explained to the people who are watching why it's so important to have secular alternatives, why it's so important to have actual real life atheists to model the fact that there's an alternative to the indoctrination and the guilt trips and the hate of the fundamentalists. And then Coughlin comes in and says that. And I'm supposed to take it for money. He doesn't know what those fingers tangled up in your hair pushing you down. He doesn't know what that's like in the gagging. He doesn't know what it's like to try desperately not to let the tears come out of your eyes because you know that'll excite them. He doesn't know what it's like to try not to vomit. He doesn't know the terror of your body being in that perpetrator, that predator's hands. The terror, the self-hatred. <clears throat> so I get, this is comedy. This is funny. Causing people like me to be in this much pain. That's how he earns his living. And people think it's funny. So here I am, back in this ugly ass little town. With no way out. And I didn't do any good at all. And I was just sit there in that chat room with all those other messages going through and mine buried and all the rest of the text. And just screaming silently. It's not fair. Daddy, stop. My whole life I've never been good enough. I've never been afraid enough. I've never felt guilty enough. I've never been ashamed enough. I've never been deprived enough. I've never been enough pain. They can't be satisfied. 